Welcome. This is the RSOC Pink tutorial. So we're going to talk about a new project from Xilinx with our partners at the University of Strathclyde. And it's a, a low-cost teaching and research platform based on the Xilinx RSOC technology radio frequency system on chip and the Pink framework. We have three presenters today. My name is Patrick Lysett. I'm a senior director in Xilinx Research Labs. My team is responsible for the project the pink side of it, and, and the Xilinx University program team as well. David Brubacher, my colleague, is an expert in RFSUC uh, technology, and he's going to give us the RFSUC overview today. David is the product line manager for the entire product line in Xilinx. And then Bob Stewart is a professor at the University of Strathclyde with um, tremendous expertise and, and, and reputation in uh, communications in general, DSP, mobile radio, uh, 5G, etc. And broadly, the outline is as shown here. Uh, this will be a brief introduction, hopefully even less than 10 minutes. David will open then with a discussion of the RFSOC family, the architecture, and some of the key parameters and some of the breakthroughs that the RFSOC technology introduces. And this really is a, a seminal technology. It, it, it's a highly innovative platform that rewrites what's possible uh, in this space. After that, I'll introduce the RFSOC 2x2 project, including the, the low-cost board and the other aspects of the project which are equally important, the software and the support and the reference material. For those of you unfamiliar with what's happening in the Jupiter world, I'll do a very quick uh, review of, of what Jupiter is and, and why it's important and uh, why it excites us and, and why we're seeing uh, tremendous potential in applying it to platforms like RFSOC. That will be followed by the main session, which is from Bob, and um, that will actually delve into what we really can do with this platform. And Bob will show what's new in terms of the theory. Uh, many of us who grew up in the traditional DSP syllabus were always taught that you had to beware the Nyquist sampling frequency and sample conservatively, you know, at half the, the highest rate. Those days have changed. We now have multi Nyquist bands. So the fundamental theory that we can deploy has changed. And the way we think about things is changing. And that introduces new concepts like frequency planning when you're actually exploiting fold and folding in the spectrum, being, aware, being careful not to map signals unintentionally into the regions of interest. And Bob will go through that and also demonstrate that with some relevant applications on the RSOC platform. And then finally, we'll have some next steps, a call to action, if you will. Where do I go from here if I'm interested and if I would like to uh, get involved, as we hope you will. It, this is essentially an invitation to everyone here to, to become involved. David, I'll start presenting it and let you introduce the RSOC technology. Okay, that's great. As Patrick mentioned, I'm the uh, product line manager for the RFSOC product line, and we have several different products. I'm going to focus mostly on uh, today's what we call the Gen 1 device, uh, and it's the ZU28DR. Uh, but we have many products uh, that we've come out with, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But just as a high level overview, you know, what is Zinc Ultrascale uh, plus RFSOC? And really, um, it's the first hardware, fully hardware programmable RF system on chip. And, and of course, RFSOC stands for RF system on chip. And it's basically our Zinc Ultrascale plus MPSO family with two key IPs added. One is the integrated RF class analog sampling converters. I'll talk a little bit about that today. And also our hard soft decision forward error correction block, SD fact as we know it. So if you're familiar with the Zinc MPSO Ultrascale Plus MPSOC family, you'll be very familiar with the RFSOC once you become familiar with these two key IPs. So it's just a quick look around the world. Um, you know, we have all the key uh, IP blocks like uh, 33 gig transceivers, so the hardened uh, engines like PCI Gen 3 and Gen 4. Um, the processor system, which is actually consists of a quad A53 and a dual core R5 uh, in the uh, RFSOC and MPSOC family. It's got the same programmable logic and uh, the DSP slices uh, that we have. Now, this particular family, the RFSOC, has a lot of DSPs, and that's because they're used heavily in uh, wireless system processing. Now, the IPs that we've added um, are what we call the uh, uh, integrated uh, direct RF analog to digital uh, hard IP block, RF DAC hard IP block, and the SD FEC block. So I'll cover uh, these particular IP blocks in a little more detail as we go through the presentation. <clears throat> Sorry, just give me a break. Now, 
What is RF sampling? There was a little bit of talk about that and, and the flexibility of programming uh, of, uh, you know, frequency planning and so forth that uh, Patrick mentioned, and we're going to go into more detail. But I wanted to give you kind of a, a quick summary of what it is. So in, in the old days, and, and I am, uh, I experienced this, we would actually do what we call baseband ADCs. And you would have an antenna that would be at RF. You would actually do a conversion uh, with a mixer and an LO down to essentially baseband. And this was done because primarily the ADCs worked um, in, you know, uh, up to 100 megahertz or 300 megahertz. And you had to do this in order to actually uh, convert an RF signal uh, into the digital signal. And every device, uh, we have a standard called JESD 204 uh, A, B, or C now. And this is a digital CERTES interface that converts the analog inputs into a particular digital device. So this is the way we used to do it. Now, the concept of RF sampling is we actually sample at RF. So now instead of uh, sampling at up to 100 megahertz, our RF converters work up to 4 gigahertz and above. And uh, then you uh, have this uh, digital signal right at RF. And you can do all the mixing and filtering in the digital logic. And this gives you quite a bit of flexibility because now your filtering can be done uh, digitally and reconfigured depending on your needs. Now, these particular devices first came out um, probably about eight years ago, and uh, they typically had one RF sampling converter uh, in, a, in a device. They were really expensive, and they uh, uh, consumed quite a bit of power. The breakthrough with RFSOC is we've actually integrated that RF sampling converter technology on our 16 nanometer FPGA family. And so we can then directly come in at RF on the RFSOC. It's converted at RF to digital bits and then filtered and mixed and processed digitally at that point. And this integration removes the JESD204 link, which can actually consume quite a bit of power. Okay, so they're lower power. In addition, the uh, the RF data converters uh, are implemented on 16 nanometer, which uh, in 2018 was very innovative. It's still innovative. If you look at most uh, separate data converters, they're implemented on 28 or 20 nanometer. So they actually lower power uh, because of the 16 nanometer process node. So this actually gives you a lot of advantages um, with respect to the fact that we have lower power uh, for the entire system, smaller footprint. We can achieve, you know, sometimes 70%, uh, but kind of a minimum of 50% footprint reduction because of this um, integration of the data converters. And there's actually quite a bit of flexibility with respect to the fact that you can do this redesign digitally and then have a more true software defined radio. So let's take a quick look at you know, what this thing is. Um, this is a little bit of a similar block diagram, but um, at a high level, you can have bits come in on the left. This can be uh, CIPRI, which is the common public radio interface, if you're familiar with that, 10 gig ethernet, 25 gig ethernet, but essentially ones and zeros. You can receive it with our CERTES. You can actually do uh, forward error correction on the device. You can have a modem. Uh, in the uh, programmable logic, all the logic, uh, we actually have quite a bit of IP, uh, such as digital pre-distortion, crest factor reduction, depending on what you need. And then essentially these bits are passed over to this hard block, which we'll talk a little more detail, and they come out at RF. So bits in on the left, RF out on the right, and likewise uh, RF in on the right, and then bits out. You can then use the quad, uh, ARM processors to do a variety of techniques, um, sometimes control and management of a radio or different things as you'll see throughout the presentation uh, with the PINK framework. Now, the applications are pretty broad when we came out with this. So they actually had three main markets that we, we uh, viewed for this particular device. One, of course, is wireless, aerospace and defense, and then there's a, a variety of them in SATCOM, what we call terrestrial SATCOM uh, test and measurement, and even cable access with what we call a remote phi node. All of these are very large markets uh, for the RFSOC. So broad, broad application. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch over a little bit to give you guys some understanding of how these blocks are put together so you have some basic understanding of, uh, of, of how the things are together and our, our product portfolio. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the ADC 
And we have what we call a tile. And a tile is uh, a group of ADCs. And we also have a DAC tile, which I'll talk about in a minute. But a tile has up to four ADCs, as you can see here. We uh, name them zero through three. And each ADC is connected to the package. Of course, we have buffers on it uh, that operate over the full RF range. And in the Gen 1 uh, family, this goes from DC to 4 gigahertz. Okay, so you have four independent ADCs in a tile. That's the maximum number of ADCs we can have in any tile. And we do have different numbers of tiles and configurations based upon the, the final chip. Now, we do have quadrature modulator correction uh, in the device. And then we have what's a crossbar. Uh, simply put, this allows you to send a digital word from any ADC to any uh, NCO and uh, digital uh, filtering uh, uh, block. Okay, so we have essentially an independent uh, mixer and NCO and decimate block. This is a hard block for every ADC in a tile. So this is what we call our quad ADC tile. This is actually in what we call the ZU-29DR. Now, bear with me. At the end, I'll show you the product family so you know how this all gets put together. But the um, <clears throat> simply put, the ZU-29DR has four uh, ADCs in a tile. OK, so just, you know, kind of remember that. And, and what we do is we uh, uh, have what we call a dual tile, which I'm going to jump to in a minute. Um, and that tile, what we actually do is we take two of the uh, quad tiles and then we time interleave them. OK, so because we're time interleaving these, they're sampling at twice the rate as we had in the quad tile. So what you can see here is I'll bounce between this is we have a, a, a sampling clock. In uh, two gigahertz sample mode, which would be the quad tile, this, this uh, RF sample clock can internally run at two gigahertz, and then we sample the ADCs at two gigahertz. And then that's, of course, uh, uh, what the rate we sample at, okay? Now, in the dual tile, what we do is we time interleave two of those. So now this, uh, as an entity, is sampling at four gig sample, okay? So this is essentially how we build our ADC tiles. They're either what we call dual tiles or quad tiles. Now the ZU 25, 27, and 28 are actually what we call dual tile uh, ADCs. And the device that um, the RF SOC 2x2 two two, uh, board runs this is the ZU 28DR. So it actually samples at about four giga sample. Now I use four giga sample as an approximation because the actual rate uh, is a little bit different. I think it's 4.096 gig sample. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's many ways to hook this up. Uh, with respect to the dual tile, you would have availability of one NCO and mixer, and you can actually have a real output or an IQ output. Uh, so there's a, a couple different ways to hook this up, especially with the crossbar where you can come in with IQ at RF. You can come in with a real uh, RF and then have IQ output also. So a uh, very flexible uh, interface that's all set up by some of the configuration. Now let's go ahead and take a quick look at the uh, DAC uh, tile. Now uh, we have ADC tiles and DAC tiles. So, so now a DAC tile has four independent DACs and essentially it's the mirror image. We do interpolation. Again, the interpolation on the Gen 1 is one, two, four, and eight. And this is a hard block with the filters, okay? So you can again, put this in at IQ or real, and then you can come out with the DAC output uh, um, uh, in both real and IQ mode, and there's four DACs per tile. Now, these are actually um, uh, sampling the DAC sample at 6.554 gigasamples per second, uh, in, you know, on all, all cases of the devices. So just as a quick summary, uh, our RF DAC and ADCs are implemented as hard IP blocks. Within those hard IP blocks is the sampling converters, either an ADC or DAC, and uh, they also have, uh, you know, a variety of other hard blocks within that or uh, so forth with the NCO mixers and also the uh, decimation and the ADC and the interpolate on the DAC. Now, uh, with this particular block, we can mix and match a variety of these uh, with the FPGA to get different numbers of ADCs and DACs per final device. And I'll show you again the table shortly. Now let's just take a quick look at the other uh, IP that's put into the RFSOC, and that's called the soft decision forward error correction block. 
this particular uh, block is um, uh, done for a couple reasons, but every uh, wireless system in the world uses some sort of forward error correction. And this is, of course, is that, you know, we can't transmit signals over a channel without some error. So we stuff some known bits in, a, in, a, in the signal chain. And then by using that, we can actually correct errors. Now, there's two main ones that uh, we are uh, concerned with here. One is what we call a low density parity check, uh, uh, LDPC. And that actually is used in 5G systems and also in DOCSIS 3.1, which is the dig, uh, data over uh, cable system interface specification, which is that cable access requirement. Uh, SDFEC uh, LDPC codes are quite complicated to build uh, in programmable logic and consume quite a bit of power. The other uh, code we use is turbo code, which is used for 4G. So we support both of these in this hard IP block. And to give you an example of why we do this is if we were to implement an LDPC FEC core in soft logic, it would take about 33% of the dynamic power. Now, if we uh, do the hard block, we actually get about 80% power reduction by doing hard and core. And of course, you do this when you know exactly what you want to do with you know, some configurability. So uh, that core in the, S in the RFSOC takes about 1.2 watts of uh, dynamic power. It supports like uh, 20 gigabit of LDPC encode and then uh, 2.8 gigabits per second at eight iterations of LDPC decode. And we can do um, about uh, 1.8 gigabits at six iteration on the turbo code. So if you're building uh, uh, a typical you know, wireless modem, uh, you would need this IP. And by doing it in hard logic, you save quite a bit of power and uh, programmable resources by implementing it in hard logic. So that's the reason. Now, I, I did promise you a table on the Gen 1 product portfolio, and this is it. Of course, the uh, RFSOC 2x2 and R eval kit uses the ZU28DR. And uh, this particular device has eight four gigasample ADCs. Remember, those are time interleaved. And it has eight uh, 6.554 uh, gigasample DACs, but it also has eight of the SDFET cores. So this is actually the part with the most amount of, uh, of uh, you know, kind of the full feature device, with the exception that the ZU2090R has 16 ADCs and 16 DACs. So these, of course, are what I call the quad configuration, and they sample at about half the rate, 2.058 giga samples. Now, we can then put these tiles uh, <clears throat> in hard IP blocks to create a, a, a whole variety of products. So we have everything from a ZU21 up to a ZU29, and they basically have different amounts of uh, ADCs, DACs, and SDFET blocks. You'll see we have a ZU21. It actually doesn't have any data converters at all. It just has the SDFET, and this is used in baseband processors uh, for wireless systems uh, um, typically. Um, and then we have different amounts of system logic. So this is the family, but we're going to focus uh, on this particular, uh, the rest of the project on this U28. Now, even though this has an 8x8 eight eight, and our eval kit has 8 DACs and 8 ADCs available, the RFSOC is actually a condensed version with two, uh, it's called 2x2, two two, so 2 DACs and 2 ADCs. And uh, you'll get more detail on that shortly. So I did want to just uh, give a plug for what you can get uh, through Xilinx on our standard eval kit. Uh, we call that the ZCU111. It's an 8x8. It does use the zu 28 pr And it's a board that looks like this. And we, then we have daughter cards you can plug on. And it comes very complete because we have the daughter card and all the cables to hook it up. And uh, I would just say the downside of this particular device is it's incredibly expensive. It's probably one of the most expensive kits that we uh, we build at Xilinx. And it's not because uh, we we just put the price at that point. We actually do not make much money at all on any of the valve kits we sell. Um, we, we provide them, but it's a very expensive kit to build uh, because of the amount of uh, uh, flexible configurations we put on the board and then the daughter card with all the RF connectors and balance and uh, cables. So it's expensive. That would be the downside. And the RFSOC 2x2 two two is a much more economical platform uh, to do some evaluation. Okay. So we do have a full thing here. I just wanted to show that and uh, talk a little bit about it.
Um, but that's not the main thrust of this meeting. Now, just quickly, I'm a little bit running out of time. I did want to show some of the performance. These this, these RF data converters work incredibly well. They're they're uh, in the same class as any of the Tier One analog provider IPs. Uh, when we're running the ZU28 at about uh, four giga sample at 240 megahertz, our spur-free dynamic range is about 80 dB. Okay, uh, with the HD3 setup and um, um, this is very, very good RF sampling performance. I'm just quickly looking at uh, what we call the noise spectral density and some other plots. This is actually running at uh, 900 megahertz. And the main thing here is the noise spectral density is minus 151 dBm per root hertz, per hertz, I'm um, sorry. Um, now this is actually quite good for an RF sampling converter. And when you do an RF sampling converter, rather than using E knob, which can, uh, is the whole Nyquist uh, frequency band, you really need to look at uh, noise spectral density because you're going to decimate down and you're going to have uh, a better performance. So this is a, a metric we promote within looking at RF sampling converters. And then uh, lastly, uh, the IM3 is we're seeing about 85 dBc on the DAC for IM3 performance. Uh, we also have very good uh, noise spectral density on this particular device. All of these parameters uh, you can find with our ACDC data sheet. So um, moving quickly along, we've talked a lot about Gen 1. This came out in 2018. Since that time, we've actually released an in full production on Gen 2, and that particular device is only available in a 16 by 16, but we pushed the input to five gigahertz. And we did announce about a year and a half ago our Gen 3, which is coming into production at the end of last year and early this year. We have a variety of parts. We've pushed the bandwidth to 6 gigahertz. Okay, so it's a very successful product line. And so we've continued to release and upgrade the IP. We just announced a product called the RFSOC DFE for digital front end, which goes up a little bit higher in frequency and has some other IPs on it. Um, if you need more information, I want to direct you to www.xilinks.com forward slash RFSOC. We have all the product families there, the specifications. You can find the data sheets and some white papers, which will help you uh, to get a better understanding of the RFSOC. And so lastly, I'm not going to show this in any significant detail because it's actually on the web. But if this is our Gen 1 portfolio, Gen 2 and Gen 3, and it shows all the part numbers available the amount of data converters and uh, the, uh, the you know, ba basic performance of the hard IP blocks here. So you can have a look at that at your leisure. Again, the part we're gonna be focused on today uh, is the Z28DR, okay, right here. Uh, it's the uh, Gen 1 part with the uh, four point, about four giga sample ADCs and uh, 6.5 giga sample DACs. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand that back over to you, Patrick, so you can move on to the next section. So it's easy sometimes to focus on the board rather than the project, but the project is much bigger than the board. And let me start by describing that. Um, the key, the cornerstone, of course, as David said, uh, it's difficult to produce these evaluation kits cost effectively, if you will, or, or uh, at lower price points. So what we have is a very affordable price point here of uh, just under 1900 dollars for for this two by two board and it's been designed specifically to make this technology accessible to academia and, and this is essentially a breakthrough price and this particular board features two uh, rf DAC and two rf adc channels and we'll talk a little bit how that relates to the uh, zcu 111 that david um, mentioned later on in the, in the talk today now the technology itself is very powerful but with power comes complexity and so we've been placing a lot of attention on making this uh, an easier experience for people, trying to um, make people more productive, trying to make the uh, effort of getting started easier and, and uh, on-ramping and, and sharing expertise in, in, in good ways. So the pink framework addresses that, and I'll, I'll talk about what that is uh, in a little bit of detail after I go through the, the board specs. Uh, and, and hopefully by the end of that, everybody will be comfortable with what we mean by um, Jupiter and Pink and how this relates to the uh, radio frequency system on chip device. The uh, project includes a lot of collateral of, of materials that are all open source. Uh, there are tutorial materials there. Um, all the notebooks are executable. So you can actually reproduce what we're showing you. It's not like getting a, a paper or a PowerPoint presentation. And there are many design examples. Now, 
going to elaborate on that a little bit more because these design examples frequently are small segments of an application or something that you can't reproduce. Uh, in this case, we'll give you whole spectrum analyzers uh, that operate in multi gigabit bands and uh, all of the material will be uh, free and we'll actually demonstrate the spectrum analyzers to you today so they're completely usable as, as, as they currently are. And we also have some software defined radio examples that are end to end as well. So that's all of the hardware, uh, all of the PL, the PS, the radio frequency stuff, plus the software that goes with it. And, and um, there's a dedicated project website, which we're calling rfsoc-pink.io. Um, and then we have all of the materials uh, hosted on GitHub. Uh, in fact, there are a couple of GitHub repositories uh, and, and um, all of the material that you see today, uh, including the documentation for the websites is, is on those um, repositories. And then finally, we're also supporting this initiative with a, an online community forum, which is essentially an outgrowth of, of the one we have for Pink. So RSOC 2x2 is not just a board. A key message here is it's, it's a community effort, if you will. It's an attempt to um, embrace a, a community of, of, of global expertise and, and help each other be more successful. And, and anything that anybody can contribute to, to that uh, agenda is, 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 is welcome. So then looking at the board itself, um, this is a, a, a photo of the board. We can um, treat the ZU28 Dior device that's on this as consisting of three main functional blocks. That's the processing system, which David mentioned, and that's the A53 ARM complex and, and the real-time processors as well, the O5s. Then you have the programmable logic, and there's quite a lot of that on, on this particular part, as you saw. And finally, you have the hardened RF blocks I'm focusing here more on the data converters rather than the um, SDFEC, the, the forward error correction unit, but that's present here as well. And um, some of the more notable uh, things here, I, I think push buttons and, and LEDs and all are pretty easy. We have um, DDR on both the PS and the PL. And, and um, this, this uh, gives you great flexibility on the PL side because it means you can do more complicated designs. We've uh, chosen to use uh, an interface standard called SysEG. And this has come, it's an open source standard that's come out of, um, well, it's licensed by Opal, Opal Kelly as an open standard. And a simple way to think about SysEG is intermediate between PMODs and FMCs. PMODs tend to be good for somewhere in the region of 30 to 50 uh, megahertz. FMCs are, are very powerful, they go up to 500 megahertz, and, and, and then you get into transceiver land, but they're much more expensive and complex to build with. SysEG sits in the middle. Uh, there are two versions of SysEG. There's the standard and the transceiver version. This is uh, the standard version. And to give you a feeling for that, that has 28 uh, single-ended lines, which are good for about 225 megabits per second, or eight differential lines included in those 28, which are good up to about 250 megabits per second currently. And we have some reference designs that we can share with you for that standard. So this is intermediate in terms of performance and cost, uh, and is a new uh, optimal point, if you will, in, in terms of um, um, interfacing. And I have some slides that we can go through in the question and answers if anybody would like to, to learn more about that. Um, the RF DACs, two, two of the radio frequency DACs are pinned out and two of the ADCs. And then we have external reference clocks and sync in as well. And um, we have quite a, a strong uh, portfolio of, of USB interfaces and, and Ethernet, gig inter Ethernet interfaces on the PS and also the PPS for um, synchronization with things like uh, uh, GPS and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, in terms of the DACs, as, as David said, um, the, these are very high performance DACs and ADCs. The ADCs are 12 bits with um, just over four giga samples per second. And um, they're brought out to the, uh, to the board periphery as a single end of two volts peak to peak. So they're immediately usable with antennas or, or other equipment uh, on the edge of the board. The, the, um, the DACs are the 14-bit units and they go slightly higher at six and a half giga samples per second. And um, that's the default out of the box in terms of the peak-to-peak. -peak. It's possible to reprogram uh, the peak-to-peak the -peak voltages if you actually change the um, settings on, on the RSL part itself on the board. If you look at the board's periphery for a moment, uh, this is how um, the IO is arranged. So you can see the RF uh, is primarily on the left-hand side here. And um, let's get my laser pin here. So these are the DAC uh, one and two, ADC one and two, the sync in, which allows you to sync the PLLs, 
and, and an external clock if you, if you want that option. There is a clock system here built in. There's a PM bus. There's quite a few power rails on these devices. Um, that's one of the things that makes um, these boards more difficult to design. There, there are 10 plus power rails on here. Um, there's an e-fuse for, for protection and, and these PMODs that we mentioned earlier. If we were to take the board now to look at the other sides, uh, what we see are some obvious things like push buttons and LEDs on, on the user side, on the PL side, uh, some RGB LEDs, which are nice for status. Uh, there's a user push button on the PS side. There's the CCG 40 pin Samtech connector that I mentioned previously. Uh, by the way, these things also have DNA so the board can self-identify. That's another nice feature and also voltage adjustment. So you can do anything from 1.2 to 3.5 volts on this interface. And it's auto negotiated at the time that the card is connected to the board, which is at boot. Um, and then we have some status LEDs here. Uh, we have a uh, mini display port and um, we can, uh, with a single cable on the USB um, three, we can uh, have um, a connection that, that emulates IP over USB. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then finally the boot device, which is the uh, micro SD card. And then in terms of the main subsystems, well, the um, RF DACs obviously are on the device itself, but the signal conditioning for the RF DACs is here and, and the ADCs. And this little black dot that you see here is actually the battle. So this is the um, conversion between the single ended and, and the diff input, which you would find on the RF SOC. Uh, four gig of uh, programmable logic and four gig of uh, uh, processor subsystem DRAM. We have the clock source, the internal clock source here. Uh, we have a couple of uh, TI clock chips here that are good for um, clock de jitter and, and also for uh, PLL and VCO. Uh, and these are user programmable. Um, and then you have quite a complex of, of uh, power management and power regulation going on here. And, and uh, so those are the main subsystems of, of the, the board. And we have built-in I squared C current and voltage monitoring on all 10 power rails. And this is accepted, access, accessible through Python. So there are Python APIs for this uh, and notebook examples of how to do that. Um, I mentioned the USB 3. We have this USB 3 gadget API interface. Basically, it means with a single USB 3 connection, you get IP over USB, which gives you um, Ethernet mass storage and, and, and serial device capability over a single line. Uh, there's an extensive set of uh, self-test for the I.O. peripherals. This is a fairly complex board. And um, one of the things that we will be recommending to users when they get it is that they actually go through the self-test to just verify that everything's okay. And of course, um, this, is, this is an investment that pays dividends over time. And then the user programmable uh, clock chips uh, from TI that I mentioned previously. Uh, the kit itself, that's, that's the board. The kit itself includes the board, uh, a 72 watt power supply running at 12 volts. Uh, a micro B cable for the USB 3, a couple of um, RF cables with SMA connectors. So you can actually uh, do interesting things out of the box. And Bob will show you some of those. It's, it's amazing actually what you can do with just the two cables. We, we can surprise ourselves. And then it comes preloaded with a, a Linux image, which is essentially an Ubuntu image, uh, and also the pink software framework uh, as well. And what that means is that out of the box, this is usable with, with, without actually installing any software on your PC, you can actually run up designs on this board, interact with this board and experience the, the RF sock. So that ease of use and that productivity is something that we're um, very keen to enhance and, and, and further um, improve over time. So that's the kit and the board. Let me um, progress now to the software side of things. And um, apologies to those of you who are very familiar with IPython notebooks, but I'm going to do a quick review of what's happening in that world for those who are not and then get to pink and, and how it relates to RSOC and what we're doing there. So IPython notebooks are one of the, the phenomen, phenomenal um, developments in the last say uh, 10 years. Essentially you take a, a web page, and whereas traditionally we've had text and, and uh, rich media and web pages, you now extend it so that you can actually put code and the results of executing that code into the same window. So what you're seeing in this diagram here is Python code and the results of executing that code, along with the documentation and the image uh, that re represents what you're actually trying to achieve, in this case, uh, uh, an image recognition um, uh, application. And this has grown uh, in popularity because of its use. Uh, 
uh, usefulness dramatically and it's now being taught to literally hundreds of thousands of students every year and it's been used complete um, across industry and across uh, education and in particular data scientists are using it as their go-to platform so this integration of a uh, code development environment with the traditional strengths of um, the web browser's ability to render rich media is a very, very powerful mix that enables new paradigms in, in how we approach learning. It should be said that the motivation for this project, it started as IPython and um, people liked it a lot and said, love this idea, but are we restricted to Python exclusively? And people came and said, you know, I'd like to use my Julia language. This was the MIT guys who have a very uh, impressive Julia language and the data scientists used R. Um, and so the project was morphed, if you will, from just being an IPython, a Python based system into being uh, available for any language that was inter uh, interfaced to it. And currently there are 80 or 90 different language kernels that actually support this model, including C++, for example. Uh, so it's, it's grown in, in popularity. So we've, the next stage was the people who were using the, sorry, going back here just wrong, the people liked this notebook a lot, developers liked it, but they said, we also need the other things that our IDE gives us. We want editors, we want shell windows, we want, we want the other capabilities. So the project morphed from just being Jupyter Notebooks to Jupyter Lab. And Jupyter Lab is an IDE in a single browser window, but each of these are sub-independent sub-windows, resizable, et cetera. And uh, they're all completely extensible and open source. And each one of these is an equal peer. So no, none of these windows has priority over, over or its panes has priority over another. So what you're seeing here is a preview of what Bob is going to show you. Uh, this is a Jupyter notebook for a spectrum analyzer running on RF SOC. This is the output of that spectrum analyzer and showing traffic. This is a frequency planning tool we've written as a, a Jupyter notebook. Uh, here you're seeing a console. This is just a find or treat command. And here you're seeing some productivity tools we've added. Uh, we've integrated um, hardware introspection. Uh, which complements the software introspection that you get with Python. So you can actually introspect the design that is on your FPGA and you can search it and, and find things. Like for example, I'm concerned that maybe two peripherals share the same memory map. I can find those memory maps uh, from, this, from this environment. So this is the underlying architecture. There is a Jupyter web server, which um, talks to an external uh, browser, uh, standard Google, Chrome, Safari, whatever browser, and then the support for multiple languages comes from this idea of a kernel wrapper. Each of these kernels can be a different language such as R, Python, Julia, et cetera. And you can have multiple um, languages supported by a single server. And then the notebooks that we've referenced are simply JSON files that are then delivered by the web server to the browser and the browser renders them. So people often think of uh, Jupyter notebooks as being very Python centric. But there's actually a lot of TypeScript and JavaScript code that ships with this as well to do the rendering in, in the browser. And one of the most uh, important aspects of this is it's all based on worldwide standards. Uh, so one of the most competitive uh, platforms in the world is the browser. You have many, many multinational companies vying for leadership there, whether it's Microsoft, Apple, Google, Mozilla, whatever. And the standardization and competition is such that everything here is open. And uh, Jupyter le leverages this uh, very well. And its primary uh, benefits, if you will, are the open source, the, the modularity, uh, the decoupled nature of, of the architecture and its extensibility. So recently, for example, some people rewrote the original kernel wrapper in C, C++, and that's what enabled C++ to be added. Now, if, you, if you're struggling with the idea of interpretive C++, it's partially compiled, obviously but it's quite the experience if, if you try it out. And this has become the de facto platform for data visualization. And in some ways, the browser is now the leading windowing system in the world. If you think about it, if I want a portable solution for data visualization, better to do it in a browser than have to support Windows 10 and OS X Windows and uh, whatever flavor of uh, the windowing GUI, uh, Linux GUI system I want. If I do it in a browser, I can have it on every platform. And so you're seeing the most advanced data visualization typically taking place on browsers. This architecture was um, uh, respected enough that it won the 2017 ACM System Software Award. Uh, I don't expect everybody to be familiar with that, but the other winners include Unix, TCP IP, Java, Eclipse. And so you get a, an appreciation for just how uh, well-respected this architecture is. 
and kudos to the physicists because this is a computer science award awarded to two physicists uh, who did this work and I think it's a tribute to their um, expertise. So uh, just to emphasize the point a little bit more in the last six odd years, um, we've seen an exponential growth in the adoption of uh, notebooks in general. Uh, this is actually as measured on GitHub. Uh, this is only a subset of the available uh, notebooks in the world, but you can see it's exponential growth. And, and um, most recently it was about 12.12 12 million uh, notebooks in February of this year. And uh, this, this uh, representation, this graph here is actually taken from a notebook on GitHub, which uh, both measures the automatically the, 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 the number of notebooks on, on the site and also predicts uh, up here what the projects what the growth is going to continue to be. And this is a sublimely recursive example of exactly what the authors wanted to achieve, which was we will have open source science, we will make the results publicly available, you can run them for yourself. And if you disagree with our model or you think we've made an error, you can modify it and talk. So this is open reproducible science, and this is tremendously ex exciting, and I think as relevant to engineering as it is to science. Another indication of um, the adoption of, of, of Jupyter Lab is, is this recent survey from Kaggle. Kaggle is a major competition website that is uh, used extensively by data scientists, and the leading uh, IDE here is Jupyter Lab. Now, what's noteworthy is the, the, the two uh, runners up, if you will, Visual Studio and PyCharm. Um, both support notebooks. So in, in Visual Studio today, there's extremely good support for uh, Python notebooks and, and notebooks in general, and PyCharm also. Uh, and this isn't a huge surprise because we recognize across the board that science and engineering are increasingly data-driven and big data-driven. So more and more people are using uh, data analysis tools. And we see this as a logical extension to what's happening with software-defined radio and, and radio this, um, with RFSOC because if you think of RFSOC and how David described it with those gigasampling A to Ds and D to As, it's like a big data chip. This thing is generating and, 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 and syncing and sourcing data at, at gigasamples per second with 12 and 14 bit accuracy on uh, uh, large numbers of inputs and outputs. So it's kind of uh, this, this whole area, if you like, we're seeing two convergences. One is the IDEs and the notebooks are converging. Uh, Jupyter Lab can do a lot of the IDE functions. Now the traditional IDEs can do a lot of the notebook functions. And then we're seeing data science effectively be as relevant in engineering as it is in, in, in data analysis. So, so, so not surprisingly, uh, kind of convergence going on there. If you think about this architecture, one way to think about it is to say, you know, we've been familiar with the idea of embedded web portals for forever. We have network routers and laser printers at home. And in those embedded systems, there's a little web server that throws up a portal that we can access through a browser and we can configure and control this. The same architecture essentially is what's being used in um, a, a desktop machine that's hosting uh, a Jupyter Lab. And here you see the Jupyter Lab windows and here you see the support actually for multiple languages in a single um, instance. So you've got different language kernels here. There's Python there, there's C++ and there's R, um, but they're all running on this uh, desktop machine and the architecture is that the desktop machine is acting as a web server that throws up a website, which is then accessed by the browser. And, and that's how this is all done. So our, our thought process was, what would happen if we took the IDE and tried to run it on an embedded platform? What if we wanted the best of both worlds? So essentially what we're now doing is we're running this IDE directly on the RSOC two by two board. So we now have all the power and capabilities of that Jupyter Lab environment, which was never designed with this in mind, but now we have it in the RSOC world. So we've taken the tools of data analysis, the big data tools, and we've applied them to this big data RSOC chip. And we're exploring that as an active area of research and, and developing um, solutions around that because we see great potential in it, which we hope by the end of this presentation that, that you'll see as well. So the underlying architecture then of PINK the first part of it is to take Jupyter Lab and run it as an embedded Jupyter Lab on the A53s of the RS SOC. And the rest of the architecture, the notebooks and the languages that are served through the A53s to an external client on whatever browser you want, on whatever platform you want, since it's just a browser connection. And one really nice aspect of this is 
the rendering and the visualization, the heavy work, the heavy lifting, if you like, is done by the external client, which may well have a graphics card or, or other tools at its disposal. So you can get a tremendous user, user interface and, and visualization capabilities here. Um, the second part of this is that we integrate the IPs, the hard and soft IPs of the, F, the RF SOC, such that they look as though they're Python objects in, in the overall development system. So we want to create Pythonic interfaces for these objects so that we can be more productive uh, in terms of what we can do with the platform. And to us, productivity is a combination of, of ease of use and ease of reuse. I want the platform to be easy to approach and get started with, but I also want to be able to take other people's material and find a way that I can reuse them effectively. Or if I create good material, have a way in which I can share that with other people so that they can be uh, effective quickly. We'll show examples of this today throughout Bob's demos. Um, you'll see reproducibility by executable notebooks, which is a key concept in Jupyter. You'll see some of the pipe and APIs that we have created to the RFSOC IP. So, so um, you'll be able to see how that's manipulated. One of the key things in all of this is that you want to be able to transfer data efficiently between the um, FPGA and the processor system, and um, not only efficiently in hardware, but efficiently in software as well. And this is a problem that's well addressed in, in the Python NumPy world uh, using what they call their buffer protocol. And, and um, you also see another characteristic of, of research and data analytics, particularly with large data subsets, is the power of visualization when you're both exploring and demonstrating and explaining technologies. It's incredibly powerful if you can interact with the data visually, see it from different perspectives, morph it, transform it. And, and for that, you need widget support and, and dashboards, and we'll show those. Uh, and then we've packaged, uh, we've extended the Python packaging system to include not just software, but also bit streams. So now we have these fat binaries that you can load as though they were traditional Python packages. You can do pip install spectrum analyzer and down will come a spectrum analyzer with all the software portion of it, but all the bit streams as well. And you can install that and run it directly on your RSA platform. And then all of this is open source as I, as, as I suggest. So the, one of the key examples we'll show you today is that of the spectrum analyzer. And here you see we can generate, we have some stimulus in the spectrum analyzer that we can use for tests. So this allows us to do a tone generation. And then we see the spectrum of the tone here and the spectrogram here. And this is an excellent environment for development. Um, it's a really great way to develop, to research, to learn. We can, we can mix these interactive controls. We can interact with the data that we're capturing from the target, et cetera. But there are times when this is too much, that you just want to expose the functionality to somebody without the detail. Uh, it's more of a deployment scenario. It could be that you're at a conference somewhere and you want to show off what your text analyzer does, not the notebook that does it. And for this, you have dashboards. So dashboards have come out of the data analysis world. And so you're seeing exactly the same notebook, but represented as a dashboard, which essentially is a, an instrument panel, if you want to think about it like this. So we can bundle up our notebook as, a, as a, an instrument panel or, or a demonstrator. And this is great for demonstrating your research, for giving it to people who are specialists in other areas, but not in, in your particular area. So they can just use the functionality. It can allow you to customize individual tools very quickly, uh, great for teaching. And the transition from the notebook to this dashboard is, is very, very efficient and, and, and very effective. So this technology essentially is borrowed from the data analysis community and repurposed here. And several of the examples that we will show you have uh, full working examples of, of, of uh, the dashboard capability. So we think this is a way for both industry and academia to accelerate uh, development that otherwise would take them months of effort and reuse and that's a critical component of productivity, reuse best practice from other disciplines. So at that, I'm going to hand over to Bob. Bob will put life to the words, that, to the slides that I have been showing you and show you some exciting stuff, I hope. Bob, over to you. Thank you, Patrick. So I'm going to talk about, uh, of course, the RFSOC 2x2. I'm going to do some demonstrations and then just talk about the EDU support and, and the SDR design notebooks that we've been uh, using and designing with XUP for this project and the board. Some of this, uh, you know, is, is very dear to me because if I go back to 1997, uh, I'm from the sound blaster generation of the 1980s. 
when sound cards came along in PCs and, and revolutionized many things. In some ways, we're almost at the, the same point with, with RF now. We've almost got the RF blaster with us. And I can recall in 1997, thinking forward, but never really believing that one day the day would come when on the same chip, you could be sampling at RF frequencies and essentially digitize you know, nearly everything you require all the way up to, to gigahertz. And uh, easy to draw a block diagram in 1997, but uh, difficult to conceive what might just happen in engineering to make that real. But it is real now. And what I want to show you today is some of the support that we've been involved in, in building uh, with XUP, Xilinx University program. And then I want to do some demos. But I am running live on the, the RF SOC right now. And towards the end, I hope to go live and we can maybe do some spectral exploration or other types of design. So what I'd like to show you is I'd like to run some live uh, implementations. And we're going to start with the, with the spectrum analyzer. And the spectrum analyzer comes in the base overlay. So you, you open the box and, and, and it's there, ready to run. And it really is easy to get up and running. We're then going to just add a, a little wideband antenna. So a, a $2, maybe less antenna you can get from uh, Amazon or somewhere else. And just show you, you can start straight out of the box. And we'll, we'll live scan and view some of the uh, radio frequency spectrum. And we'll go down to 90 megahertz and we'll go all the way up later to four gigahertz just demonstrating that absolutely we are digitizing the, uh, the spectrum all the way up to four gig, which is our sampling frequency. And we'll explore a few signals and we'll see some spectral characteristics. And if we had time, you can look up databases and you can work out that if it's FM, TV, 4G, 5G, uh, we can see it all. We'll uh, realize that we, you know, we have to do things properly and uh, we'll add in an anti-alias uh, filtering stage just to show what happens there. And we'll relate that to the whole business of uh, higher order Nyquist sampling. And once again, we, we cannot do a complete tutorial today, but we'll show you the extensive uh, materials and notes that we've, we've put into the, uh, the project that you, you, you have instantly available if you acquire one of the boards. I'll also add a little uh, wideband uh, low noise amplifier. So I'm a signal processing software defined radio guy. I'm not really an RF guy, so uh, I've got myself a cheap amplifier off the web and, 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 it, and it works great. We'll also use the frequency planner. So life's a little bit more difficult now that we're uh, digitizing such a wide band and now that we're, we're doing Nyquist, uh, higher order Nyquist sampling. So actually you've got to learn a little bit more and some of the things that are perhaps not taught now in, uh, in, in university courses, but will be soon because this is the way forward and everyone will have to understand some of the aspects of higher order Nyquist sampling and just what happens with uh, various types of uh, harmonic components and so on. And I'll uh, just show some things in the second order zone and we'll use Wi-Fi because that's available to me uh, right now. So the, the UK uh, RF spectrum, so this is uh, not a detailed presentation, but uh, if you were to go look up our Ofcom database, you can see exactly what is it, all of the different frequencies uh, in, in the UK band up to uh, you know, high uh, tens of gigahertz. Some of the things that we will instantly see in just a few minutes, uh, we can be down here uh, looking at some of the uh, uh, FM radio, and then we can maybe, uh, we can short range devices. I can get my car keys out. We'll have a look at the eight megahertz television bands. We'll have a look at some 4G. We could maybe look at 5G up at 3.5 gig uh, and so on. It's, it's all gonna be visible to us. Uh, and of course, if you want to build a, a system where you're acquiring a particular band, yes, you may need other RF front end filters. You, you will need uh, internal DSP decimators and uh, filtering and so on but I'll show you the high level. I'll show you where our resource materials are. And when you get the board, we hope you will be started very quickly. And of course, above uh, 1.7 gigahertz, we can still go. We've got old 3G and we get satellite, we get Wi-Fi, and, uh, and then we get 5G in the UK up at 3.5 gigahertz and US has got CBRS shared spectrum and we can go all the way up to millimeter waves 
uh, and again, using a suitable intermediate frequency system, the RF SOC is absolutely perfect for uh, high uh, tens of gigahertz as well. So, you know, in the box, uh, you can get started fast. And uh, that's one of the exciting things about getting a hold of one of these cards. Uh, you'll get the RF SOC, the, the two by two that, that Patrick has shown, and, and, and David gave us uh, some of the, the details on the, on the RF SOC device. It'll come with uh, cables per supply. And on the right hand side, I've added a couple of other things that I'll use today. So, the RF SOC, you will get uh, your RF cables and, of course, your power supply, and you can get a cable to connect to your, uh, to your computer. Uh, some useful low cost add ons I've used today, and I do mean low cost, a, a few dollars. Uh, we're going to use a, a, a simple wideband uh, antenna. We've got a couple of low noise amplifiers. We've got some uh, inline filters. So these are RF filters, maybe low pass or high pass or band pass. Uh, and again, if you've got some real application in mind, you obviously buy the right RF uh, filter and some attenuators just to make sure that uh, uh, there's no risk of putting in uh, too much power uh, or voltage level into the RF. Uh, ADCs. And the, the fastest way to get started is to use these uh, RF uh, cables and do a look back. And one of the, the first examples you can open, I'll show you in just a few minutes, the spectrum analyzer uh, also comes with the tone generator and you can start generating tones. And from the digital to analog converter, you can be outputting at some high gigahertz rate and you can be receiving at a high gigahertz rate on the ADC. So almost instantly you can be up and running with, with nothing else. You don't need amplifiers, you don't need antennas. You can just get moving straight away. Now I will be adding a few more components. So I'm just showing you on the, on the screen here what I have. I, I've got a couple of uh, 40, $50 amplifiers easily available uh, probably next day on, on the likes of Amazon or other vendors. So I have a, a, what we call a, a, a little Neulek amplifier here. And we have a slightly different style here that I'm using. There's just a very cheap couple of dollar uh, antenna. So clearly won't be optimized for uh, all frequencies, but as you'll see, it does a pretty good job of capturing a very wide band. And we have uh, connections into our RF uh, ADCs. We've got a power and we've got our connection to the, the computer. We've also got a little inline filter here. So I have an anti-alias filter in one channel and I don't have one in the other. Now, one change that we have uh, you know, with uh, likes of RF SOC technology is that we're no longer just dealing with sampling and getting all of the information from zero to FS over two or half of the sampling frequency. So the, kind of, the, the classic learning that we all do is we learn about the sampling frequency and you can then see all frequencies from zero to FS over two. So in this particular uh, you know, example, if we do sample at four gigahertz or we're actually using 4.096 in some of the examples, you can see everything up to two gigahertz and, and that's kind of classic signal processing that uh, that we all, we all learn at some point in a, in, a, in a graduate course if you do double E. But of course, with the RF SOC technology, uh, we can also work in the higher order bands and we can work in the higher order bands and we can be uh, receiving and generating. So if we went to the, the second order band, then from two gigahertz to four gigahertz, if, if we have a suitable analog band pass, so you do have to try and make sure you, uh, you uh, just select the two gigahertz to four gigahertz, or you do some uh, particular forms of frequency planning that I'll point out to you later. Then when we do sample this band, we can see, yep, it aliases down to baseband. And as everyone knows, it flips uh, in the direction. So I'll show you that happening. And once again, this is how we can sample all the way up to four gigahertz. And of course, in future generation products uh, that, that, that David was talking about, uh, will be going higher and the opportunity perhaps for higher, or, higher order Nyquist bands as well. So this in, in, in many ways is, is something that uh, 
when we learn kind of classic signal processing, uh, digital signal processing classes, we, we, we tend to dismiss everything above FS over two because that's not available. Well, it absolutely is available now and will not only be receiving, we'll be transmitting and we'll be using these higher order Nyquist band, the second, uh, the second zone to create signals all the way up to four gigahertz if we're sampling at four gigahertz. Now there's more detail, we're using quadrature modulation, uh, we're using quadrature sampling. So, so again, the, the detail, what we've worked very hard to do is make sure that's available for people in the notebooks, which I'll be showing you uh, shortly. So the, the, the notebooks that we have, so again, when you get your board and, and uh, you get your base overlay and you, you download some of our materials, we've been working with XUP just to produce some notebooks on, on the fundamentals. Some of it will be a reminder, some of it will be new information just about uh, the, 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 the special features of the RF SOC and of course, higher order uh, Nyquist bands and, and sampling. So that you know, some of the key ones we have at the moment are uh, just you know, reminding you about sampling and quantization. And again, life's a little bit different now because we're going above half the, uh, the Nyquist rate working with frequency spectra, baseband modulation, filtering, modulate and demodulate. And, and once again, remember this device can go all the way up to generate signals at four gigahertz or receive signals at four gigahertz. And we'll tell you about the RF SOC architecture. So we have our own tutorial on the materials that will we'll, we'll, we'll try and allow you to understand uh, just what's new, what's real and what you can do. And as well as those uh, you know, fundamentals, we have some advanced uh, designs. And I do mean advanced. We've got a, a full OFDM transmit and receive. So we've got up to 1,024 cam, quam. Uh, so if you know anything about OFDM, this is, this is the real deal. This has got all the timing and all the synchronization. And you can choose to transmit at whatever frequency you wish, as long as you've got the appropriate RF uh, amplifiers for transmit and receive. Remembering, of course, uh, you need to be careful about transmitting because it's not legal to transmit in certain frequency bands. So always check what is legal in your area or what power levels you must use or you will use a cable. We also have uh, machine learning. So we have an interest in machine learning. And from a signal processing point of view, we have uh, some notebooks that will talk about modulation classification. So receiving a signal on the air and trying to decide what it is, AM or FM or QPSK, or what would it be? So a form of, of pattern recognition. Uh, some of the demonstrators, so we've clearly got the spectrum analyzer, which comes with the, the base overlay, and we might call these reference designs as well. You can, you can uh, make some very advanced uh, tools and transmitters and receivers. We have an OFDM, RF, transmit and receive. We have QPSK. We have a BPSK example from first principles, which is teaching you the basics of how to start from zero and, and build a full uh, transmitter and receiver. And then we have some presentations uh, and notebooks on uh, automatic gain control, very important feature of any radio frequency uh, system. I'm now going to look at the spectrum analyzer and uh, the, the plot you can see in the right hand side, I'll, I'll have in a couple of videos and then I will move uh, live to that. Um, what I'm keen to demonstrate today is how it really is how easy it is to get up and running with this board. And as long as you have a basic understanding of, uh, of, of connecting things together, a little bit of uh, awareness of uh, radio frequency and signal processing within minutes, you will be digitizing the entire spectrum from zero to, to four uh, gigahertz. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to switch to uh, just a couple of videos. So I'm just going to open a video and share my audio. First, connect your computer to the USB or network port of the RF SOC 2x2. Next, connect a 12 volt power supply to the power connector. Then connect your antenna by screwing to SMA port ADC1.
Switch on the RF sock 2x2 at the red arrow. You are now ready to receive some RF off the air. Now, it'll take you longer to open the box and take all the plastic packaging off and get the cables out of the bag. Uh, clearly, there's some software installation to do, but in terms of the, the physical hardware, I'm taking a $2 antenna and I'm connecting it straight to the board. Now, clearly, it's going to be a very low power signal. However, as we'll demonstrate, it's sufficient that uh, we can receive all the way from zero to four gigahertz and, and indeed probably higher. And that's it. We've got the power, we've got the connection to the computer, we've loaded up uh, uh, our software on the, the PC, and we are we're ready to roll, just running from a browser. So uh, let me go to the next uh, demonstrator. So this is this is me uh, communicating with my board. So I'm, I'm actually doing this over a, uh, an Ethernet uh, uh, connection and I'm going to set up the RF SOC. So I'm just going to let this run and I'll, I'll stop at a couple of convenient points. Uh, but this is something I, I really did do earlier. I got up early this morning and these are signals that are coming from that uh, simple antenna, no amplifier. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in the attic room of my house, so I do have the antenna out the window just to improve some of the external uh, reception. But uh, this is us ready to go. Now that we have our notebook up and running, we're connecting and talking uh, to the RF SOC, as Patrick pointed out, uh, through the browser. And let me allow this to run. Start by uh, setting up the spectrum analyzer. So I'll just double click on RF SOC spectrum analyzer. And I can now see in my browser, I've got the hardware accelerated spectral, spectrum analysis on the RF SOC. So we won't focus and go through this in detail uh, today, but there's a little review telling you how this spectrum analyzer is actually being built. It has two channels, channel zero and channel one. And we just have to get the, uh, the software run. So we'll run the first piece of code. And we'll now initialize the analyzer and set up the user control. We also have a tone generator, which we'll use for some loopback. So let's start the tone generation and let's then start the spectrum analyzer. So we'll just wait till everything's uh, loaded, initialized, and then we'll do some frequency inspection of the radio band. So I'm going to switch the transmitter off. We don't need that at the moment. So both of the tone generators are off and we're just going to head down to the spectrum analyzer. And on channel one, we have just the antenna connected to the board. There's no connection to any anti-alias or amplifier, just an antenna connected to the ADC1 input. And the antenna is in fact on the roof of my house as I'm in the attic. So let me switch on the spectrum analyzer. And I can see that I'm going from just above uh, DC here to about 1.8. That's what we are presenting at the moment. So let me just center this at 820 megahertz. And now I can see from DC all the way to nearly two gigahertz, 1.8 gigahertz is shown in the plot at the moment. So if we just look at what we're receiving and we'll move with the cursor to see down here is about a hundred megahertz. So that's our FM radio stations. Here we have about uh, 220 megahertz. That's our digital audio broadcast. There's some other bands here, but let's move up to around about 600, 620 megahertz. So that's the television band uh, in Glasgow from the local Black Hill transmitter here. And if we head up to 800, well, around about 800 is the LTE band for the four UK mobile network operators. And there's some other mobile signal at about 900. And I can also see activity up here at 1.4, but we'll maybe come back to that a little bit later. So let's zoom in and look in a little bit more detail at some of the spectral bands. So I'm going to start with centering at 100 megahertz. 
and then I'm going to increase the decimation and it'll give me a little bit more resolution. In fact, I'll go to 128 decimate and now I can see my individual FM radio stations. So having lived in Glasgow for a long time, I know that 10, uh, 102.5 is Radio Clyde in the city. And uh, we have uh, something down about 94.3 is Radio Scotland. So I can very clearly see the radio stations. And I can do just a simple zoom if I wanted to zoom in and get a little bit more detail. We can zoom in. We're just zooming the plot. We're not increasing spectral resolution at this point. And I'll take that home and reset the axis. So there's some FM. And again, if you do want more spectral resolution, we can continue to decimate. And we could go all the way down to 512, in fact, 1024, to see more resolution of an individual station. And now you can see that the bandwidth of a station is about 200 kilohertz, which is exactly what it should be for FM. So let's return to looking at virtually the whole uh, Nyquist band. And I'll take the decimation back down to two. So again, here's 100 uh, megahertz down here. We just had a look in detail there. We'll skip past DAB and we'll move past this uh, energy at 400 and let's go to 600. So let's now look at 620. Uh, go to 626 megahertz and we'll increase the decimation. And I can now see my TV channels. And TV channels are 8 megahertz wide. So I can see the 8 megahertz windows here and I can see the guard band or the spacing between these different 8 megahertz channels. And in fact, at our Black Hill transmitter, there's at least a multiplex of at least four 8 megahertz bands. And that's what I can uh, clearly see here. And again, if you want some more resolution, we can do that by, uh, by zooming in. And again, you can see the, uh, the, the guard bands. Now, remember, we have no anti-alias filter here. So we actually have uh, an issue whereby any energy from the second order Nyko zone is actually folding down. So we're just doing something simple and rough with an antenna and nothing else. No active components, no amplifier, no gain. Let's return to look at the full band again. So we can now see the full spectrum band. And let's go to 800 this time. And we'll actually go to uh, 811. And then we'll zoom in. And now, well, this is my 4G radio signal. And in fact, I can see that there's one uh, 20, 10 megahertz channel here another 10 megahertz channel here. And in fact, this is uh, the UK mobile network operator Vodafone, their downlink, and this is Telefonica at O2, and it's their downlink. So again, I'm able to pick that up with my simple antenna. So let's return to looking at the full band. So I'll center an 820, and I'll go back to a decimation of two. So again, DC all the way to nearly uh, two gigahertz. 1.6 gigahertz. So I'm going to do something else. So let's just look around here, around about 433, and see if anything happens. So just keep your eye there. So what actually was happening there was I have my car keys and I have a RF remote control. And that fires at 433 megahertz. So let's center on 433. And we'll zoom in. So I can see really nothing happening at the moment at 433. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, press the button on my car key. So I press three times, maybe four, and you could see the energy. You could see whatever the uh, the communication scheme is, energy popping up around 433 megahertz. 
Now, sometimes for a signal that uh, is transient like this, of course, you would want to track it over time. So we also have a spectrogram. So looking just below this uh, spectrum analyzer plot, and if I switch on the spectrogram, and you can just see its noise. But if I now press again, And the three presses you can see down here in the spectrum analyzer, we have time versus frequency. So for any signal, really, we can uh, run the spectrogram and allow you to see how the signal might be evolving over time. And it's also good for picking up very small low level signals. So you can see a couple of bits of energy here, which may be signals in the real world or it may be some nonlinearity that we'd have to investigate. And again, you can see something else happening over here. So this actually looks like a real signal, something happening at 422. And looking this up, it's actually got something to do with the mobile network operators on, on 422 to 424 and some additional signaling for their network. So let's return to looking at the first order Nyquist zone. So we'll center again at 820. We'll widen the window, our decimation of the data is only a factor of two. So again, we can see from about DC all the way to 1.6 gigahertz. So we had a look at FM. We had a look at some of the TV signals. We saw some LTE and uh, there's another signal over here at 1.4, which, well, I've not really discussed what that is yet, but that's something I'll look at in just a minute because actually that signal isn't at 1.4 gigahertz. It's actually a signal that is aliasing from the second order band. So that's part of the problem uh, that we have to solve with anti-alias filters for the first or second order bands. And we have to therefore put inline filters in place. So that's just a quick run through the, the uh, RF spectrum from zero to nearly two gigahertz. So zero to FS over two so far. Uh, and once again, you, you can be doing that really within minutes of opening the board and being, being ready to run. And it was just a plain antenna, no gain. Of course, if we start learning a little bit more about the RF world, we probably would like some gain. We would like some uh, anti-alias filtering uh, and we would like to make sure that we've got uh, perhaps some uh, channelizing uh, filters as well. Again, depending on what you're doing. So I'm just going to add in a simple amplifier stage. And again, this is something that you can do uh, and something that, uh, you know, it's a few tens of dollars to buy these uh, wideband amplifiers. So they're pretty good low noise amplifiers. So let me show you what, what we're going to connect next and then I'll show you what happens. We can insert a wideband amplifier after the antenna. This is a low noise linear wideband variable gain RF amplifier. Connect the amplifier output to the RF SOC 2x2 ADC1 input. Connect the antenna to the input of the amplifier. Connect the power to the amplifier. And now ready to receive amplified RF signals over the air. But be aware, in this setup, there is no front-end anti-alias filtering, so higher order Nyquist bands will alias to baseband. So aliasing to baseband, uh, that's uh, just something, again, we have to be aware of, and we are aware of it. Uh, and we'll also be analyzing it when I show you the, the frequency planner that anyone working in this domain has to be more aware now of frequency planning. So let's also consider uh, an anti-alias filter. So that's just an amplifier in line. So if I wanted to put in an inline anti-alias filter, again, not too expensive, you can get these uh, filters off, the, off the, uh, the, the web. So let me show you where we put uh, the anti-alias filter. We can insert a low pass anti-alias filter before the amplifier. This is a mini circus inline low pass filter, DC to 1300 megahertz. There's at least 40 dBs of attenuation across the stop band. Depending on your signal of interest, sometimes you might put the filter after the amplifier.
You're now ready to receive some RF off the air with an anti-alias filter attenuating the second order Nyquist band. And we switched on at the end there. Uh, so that's us put an anti-alias filter in. Now remember, I've got two channels. I've got uh, I've got uh, uh, channel zero and channel one. So I'll just do another example, just showing you the effect of that that simple anti-alias filter. So it's cutting off at 1300 megahertz or 1.3 gigahertz. And I've only chosen that. That was just one of the filters I had available. But you can see that uh, given my sample rate is four gigahertz, zero to two gigahertz is my Nyquist band. And I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing most of the lower part of the, of the, uh, the Nyquist band. So let's just look at the difference that that filter will make for us. So let's uh, let's switch off the spectrogram so we can focus just on the spectrum analyzer. And I'm going to go to uh, spectrum analyzer channel zero now. And I'm going to switch it on. And the difference we have here, and let's set to the same frequency band, 820 center, is that we have an anti-alias filter. So we have the filter mentioned before, 1300 megahertz cutoff. So zero to 1300 megahertz is passing. And above that, it's been attenuated by at least 40 dBs. So, so just what you can see here, the, 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 the 1.3, so 1 1.3 gigahertz is about here, if you can see where my mouse is moving. And if you can recall the, uh, the low pass characteristic, we're getting about 40 dBs above 1.3 or 1300, 1 1.3 gigahertz or 1300 megahertz. So this is channel zero, where we do have the anti-alias filter in place. And in channel one, we don't. And quite simply, you'll see that in this one, we, uh, we, we have uh, no energy above one more, very little energy above 1.3 other than the, the noise. So let me restart. Again, just a simple plain antenna we don't have any amplification stages and it's a passive filter. So viewing from DC baseband all the way up to uh, just viewing 1.6 gigahertz with no anti-alias, we can see that above 1.3, we're still getting energy coming through. And if I look now in channel zero, where I do have a anti-alias filter at 1300 megahertz, we can see that uh, this energy has been attenuated. So that's a, a placement of my anti-alias filter. Now, we did also speak, just we go back for a second, we did also mention that uh, we can put the, the amplifiers in line as well. So I'm going to add the amplifier in line uh, in, in the spectral analysis. You saw me do the small video for that. And I'll demonstrate uh, again that if, with a little amplifier, you can obviously put some gain in there. Uh, careful, not too much gain. Uh, but uh, again, my signal coming from my antenna is very small. So I don't really, I'm not really concerned about uh, uh, saturating the input stage. So we're now going to add the amplifier in line. So we've now plugged in the linear wideband amplifier. So that's giving gain across all uh, the frequencies in our zero to uh, gigahertz band, four gigahertz. So if I now change the gain, then you can see as I put the gain up and down, the, the plot changes. So we can see it manifesting itself as a noise floor dropping. And I can put on gain, of course, not too much gain. Uh, there's a danger that you might saturate the ADC, although I'm using a very, very low power uh, input from my antenna. So there's not going to be much chance of that here. But you can see that with, uh, with the amplifier, we can add our gain, and that will maybe help you find and, and amplify signals that you might want to review and receive. If we zoomed in, round about the mobile frequencies again. So let's go to 811. Let's give ourselves some more decimation. So again, you can see that if I, if I change the gain, I can clearly amplify my signal in some way. So that's a gain stage being added in to my device. So let's just leave it there. And what I'm going to do is add in an anti-alias filter now. 
So we've now added the anti-alias filter and you don't see a great deal of difference here. But if we go back to the main window again, we can see that because we're removing components above 1300 meg, uh, 1300 megahertz, you can see some energy from high frequency signals still gets through. It's only attenuating by about 40 dBs. But now we've done a pretty good job of, of band limiting in our, our baseband. Remembering our first order micro zone goes from 0 to 2048 megahertz or 2.048 gigahertz. Now, of course, uh, we're showing you this, and uh, again, this works out the box. It's in the base overlay, the spectrum analyzer, and the other notebooks. I will show you, or uh, you can you can download these very quickly. Of course, we we had to do the DSP design for this, so that design has been done, and uh, you know the engineering team have put together the spectrum analyzers and the OFDM and all of the other uh, signal processing software defined reference examples. Then everything's been packaged up. Then it's been put into the, the, the pink environment and runs on the, on the board. Uh, and we have these uh, kind of Jupyter notebooks and lab facilities that make it very easy to engage in, in control. And just to, uh, just to remind you that, uh, of course, in, uh, in creating this, we, we had to build the signal processing design. So, so that uh, was actually done uh, for the spectrum analyzer and some of the other designs with MathWorks HDL coder. So working inside Simulink, we, we built the FFT, we built all of the filtering stages and all of the options to change the decimation ratio, the options to change uh, other uh, parameters. Some components were done in Xilinx System Generator, also running in MathWorks Simulink. And again, that can leverage Xilinx IP and, and cores. And then this is all integrated into a pink design and uh, appropriate memory interface simulation and the, the, the transfer uh, of, the, of the data, test it, get it up and running. And what you're now seeing is the, is the finished product. So it's, it's very convenient to then run and it's very convenient to then change some of the parameters. So let's watch the FFT or the spectrum analyzer running and let's show you how we can change some of the, some of the parameters inside the uh, inside the FFT. So I'll just go back to the spectrum analyzer and we'll drop down some parameters again, running in our browser uh, on our computer, which is talking to uh, the RFSOC two by two. So we'll just do a little bit of FFT. So what we have now on channel zero, there is no anti-alias filter and channel one, we have a filter cutting off again around about 1300 megahertz. So you can see the energy above here has been reduced using slightly different amplifiers. Uh, one is a new elect with no variable gain and the other one is a one with variable gain, as we showed in the diagram earlier. So just some other things that we can do. So let's choose again to look at the 100 megahertz band. And let's Zoom in a little bit to see the FM radio stations again. And we'll go even lower. So we can see a particular uh, station here, around about 99.5 uh, megahertz. So let's just push in a little bit more. So we're going all the way down to a decimation ratio of 1024. So again, we're zooming in. Now, the spectrum analyzer, of course, has other types of settings. And we can use classic windows as well. So we've just been defaulting to a Blackman window. But of course, you can choose to change this to rectangular. And again, depending on what you understand about the process of windowing, or we could have a classic Hamming window. And once again, this might help you observe your data in some particular way. So that's another feature that's in the Spectrum Analyzer and available in both channels. So if we go away from the window settings and inside the spectrum analyzer as well, we can change the number of sample points in the FFT. So we could increase the resolution one more step so we can get up to 8192. And again, we get much better or we get improved resolution. And you can work out the resolution of an FFT by taking the sampling frequency and dividing by the number of samples. Uh, and of course, we have to work with the decimation frequency.
So a few DSP things to review and, and, and remember, but this spectrum analyzer is working according to all the classic mathematics and rules of the FFT. Nothing ever changes in the world of mathematics. There's some further settings, plot settings, which just uh, are parameters that will allow you to change the way the plot looks. So we, we only plot 80% of the Nyquist stop band. Uh, we could, of course, change that to be higher. And in terms of the, uh, the plot height and the, the plot width, again, these are user controllable parameters and also how often you update uh, the screen. And just not forgetting, just another quick view. If you want to put the spectrogram on and you want to see a signal changing over time, then here's our FM radio stations and you can actually see the, the kind of characteristic uh, time frequency of an FM signal. So the spectrogram can be very useful in, in many different circumstances for observing your signals. So far, you know, kind of really amazing outputs, uh, real productivity. Uh, and what I'd like to do is just look briefly into the uh, second order Nyquist zone. So a reminder that with the device we're using, we've been working in the, the baseband or the, the first order Nyquist zone. Uh, but of course, one of the features of uh, the RF SOC is that we can use higher order Nyquist bands and we can sample from two gigahertz to four gigahertz. So it's all a function of the type of quadrature system we're doing and a uh, function of the technology. But from a signal processing point of view, we will see this higher order band alias down to the baseband. So that means that you've got to keep track of where your signal ends up. So what that could mean, for example, is that if you have a, a Wi-Fi signal and that Wi-Fi signal is uh, you know, 2.4 uh, gigahertz, then when you bring that into your design, well, it's not going to be 2.4 gigahertz. It's going to appear somewhere down here. And it's going to appear at a frequency. Well, anyone who's done uh, signal processing knows how you work out the frequency. You, you work out this difference and, uh, and then you subtract it from FS over 2. And not difficult, but a little bit inconvenient. So once again, the frequency planner tool will do some very advanced things, but it'll also help you with some of the simple things of working out where your signal will end up. Where do you find the Wi-Fi signal in your uh, sampled uh, data stream? So I'll, uh, I'll try and show you another example uh, doing that. And uh, we'll start off with just a tone, and then we'll look for Wi-Fi, and I'll set up a Wi-Fi signal on my phone. I'll download a file so my phone will start running in Wi-Fi, put it next to the antenna, and you'll see that uh, my Wi-Fi is going to appear in the baseband somewhere down about 1.6. Let's look at the Wi-Fi. So again, we have from zero to about just above 1.6 gigahertz and our center frequency 820 decimating by two. So we can see most of the, the Nyquist band. What we're gonna do is see if we can see Wi-Fi now. Now Wi-Fi is at 2.4 gigahertz, therefore it's sitting uh, in the second order Nyquist zone. So just to help me with that, I'm going to use the frequency planner tool. So again, we put a version of this that will, will, will run on the RF SOC two by two. So it's uh, taken the Xilinx tool that's been available for some time, and we've put an instance uh, to, to help us run when we're doing uh, designs within the RF SOC two by two. So heading to the ADC, so it's a pretty simple use of the tool here. My spectrum analyzer is sampling at 4,096 mega samples a second, 4.096 gigahertz. And my Wi-Fi is going to be around about 24, uh, maybe 2450. So if I look to see where that will appear, then according to the plot I have over here, so there's a lot of other information about harmonics and other uh, more advanced frequency planning components. And I'm afraid we won't have detail uh, or time to do in detail today. But if I now just look to see, so around about 1636 to 1656. So if I look in this band here, I might expect to see Wi-Fi aliasing down to the first order Nyquist zone. So remember, I'm not using any anti-alias filter here at the moment. 
so everything in the second order zone will fold down. So let me return uh, to the spectrum analyzer still running on the board and let's place uh, a center frequency at 16.45. Uh, and we don't see much activity, we see occasional things happening there, but let's let's zoom in a little bit more. So we'll zoom in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my phone up on Wi-Fi and I'm going to download a large file. And as I down the large, download the large file, we should see activity. You can already see some Wi-Fi uh, signals popping up. So this is the aliasing from uh, 2.4. So let me download a file now. So I'll start downloading the file now. You can now see lots of activity as my phone goes onto the Wi-Fi and begins to download. Now, as before, we could uh, we could center that a little bit more, and we could zoom in a little bit more as well. So that's the alias from the Wi-Fi. Let's take it back to the full band. Decimate by two. And we're back to seeing. So it's just just off uh, the, the, the screenshot here. Let me just conclude by uh, by sharing with you some of the things that uh, we have. So I'm going to actually going to go live to my board. So here's my board here. It's currently running. It's uh, uh, it's uh, connected, it's connected to an antenna on uh, on the roof of my house, and this is what I'm seeing at the moment. Over on the left hand side, we can see uh, some of the facilities we will give you. So the DSP notebooks, uh, baseband modulation, filtering, frequency spectrum, machine learning. These are full designs, full descriptors, uh, full notebooks that will get you up and running. And again, all open source, as, as, as Patrick says. We also uh, have an OFDM demonstrator. So this is a reference design. And if I open this up, it's now running. It's now on the board. And this is a full OFDM transmit receive. So everything, uh, building the transmitter, building the receiver, all of the synchronization. And uh, you can transmit over a, a cable or you can transmit uh, over the air if you have the appropriate licenses and, and hardware. There's just an overview of the RF SOC architecture. So again, this is a notebook just teaching you, trying to teach you about what's going on in the RF SOC and what the generations are. So the concept is that everything is running on the RF SOC and running inside notebooks. So just to let me close, the frequency planner, we really touched in the frequency planner. This is a great tool that Xilinx have provided. And we have an instance on the board that just helps you with all of the folding and other non-linearities. We, we don't have time today to talk about the non-linearities that exist, uh, but we do talk about them in the notebooks. And we also do uh, use the frequency planning tool so that it will help you design and help you make sure you choose the best sample frequency uh, in order to maximize the chances of receiving your signal. So Patrick, on that, I will uh, stop and pass back Thanks, Bob. So one of the things we like about the spectrum analyzer is it covers two domains. On the one hand, clearly it's a, an instrument for communications uh, researchers, but it's also just that, an instrument. Many people will use the RS SOC outside of communications. They'll be interested in the A to Ds and the D to As for other reasons. So in fact, the spectrum analyzer covers both spheres very nicely. The, the user interface, the control of the uh, FPGA blocks, the control of the uh, RF SOC hard IP, all of that is demonstrated by the um, spectrum analyzer design. Clearly in itself, I mean, that kind of spectrum analyzer is almost like a bonus contribution, if you like, of the, of the RF SOC 2x2 two two kit. Uh, it's quite a useful lab tool in itself. And we'd actually issue a, an invitation to everybody who has an interest in this, come and help us make it better. It's an open source design. If you can think of things that you could do with it or further enhance it, we'd be delighted to hear. So for next steps, we want to invite you to, to join the community. Uh, we want to invite you to get involved, to, to use what we have, but more importantly, to contribute and to extend what we have so that the, I guess the, 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 um, the water level rises for everybody. You know what they say, a, 
a rising tide lifts all boats. And that, that would be our definition of success here. The first step, of course, is to get hold of a board. And, and this process is fairly simple. You go to the XUP website uh, and you get pre-approval that you're a bona fide academic to qualify for this breakthrough price. Um, we'll quickly review your, your request and we'll issue you with an email to say you're good to go. We'll tell the, our partners, High Tech Global, who are making the board that, that you're uh, pre-qualified and then you're able to purchase it for them at the um, price advertised earlier, just under $1,900. There isn't a lot of point going directly to the HTG website because all that will happen is you'll get redirected back to the XUP website to get pre-approved. Um, we have to be careful at this price that the, the boards are going into the hands of the right people. And, and so we have to do some diligence. This is the XUP website. Uh, it's, it's on its main uh, page. And you can see here, this is the landing page uh, currently for the XUP program with the board. If you click on this or go directly to this page, you'll get the RSUC page. And there's a purchase option up here that, um, let me just highlight that for a second. Uh, there's a purchase option here that will take you into the, the, the flow that we've just shown. So it's so a very simple process and, and we welcome you uh, there. And this is the High Tech Global page for the board. And, and um, this is the board partner that's manufacturing this. And High Tech Global themselves have um, more powerful boards that they produce and sell. So once you're on this site, you'll be able to see larger boards as well if they're of interest to you. The collateral that Bob talked about, we have the RSOC Pink.io site. Uh, this is a, a, our go-to site for all things RSOC Pink. This is the landing page. This is the getting started page. So there's some videos on here, which Kyle and the team have put together to help you get started and, and, and just get up and running quickly. Um, there's a lot of collateral. Under the overlays, you'll see some of the things that Bob has already referred to. These are direct page copies from the, the overlays tab on, on, on the RSOC. You see the spectrum analyzer, the frequency planner, the OFDM stuff, et cetera. Um, there are also the tutorials, uh, educational resources, including how to work with RSOC, um, some of the basic theory of, of sampling and, and, and uh, multi Nyquist, et cetera. These are all, again, open source and available to anybody who wants them. Um, we have a, a support forum, which is, is via Pink. We use Discourse, and this is just discussed at pink.io. And we track this and, and try to answer any questions that, that, that crop up here. Now, here we typically answer Pink and RSOC two by two questions. If it's a deep Favado or Vitus question, we would recommend you go to the appropriate um, uh, forums for those questions. And we'll help you with that transition. Now, as you can see, the RSOC 2x2 is, is a, a complement to the ZCU 111 that David showed us earlier. Um, but all of the resources are available currently for both platforms. So if you're an industry person looking at this and saying, this is great, but I can't have any of this. No, that's not true. You can have all of this at the moment. It's all available on uh, the ZCU 111. In fact, my understanding is that we have a four channel spectrum analyzer on the ZCU 111. And for those academics who already invested or uh, in the ZCU 11 or want to buy one because they need more channels, again, this material is available to you there. So we've done the best we can. We see this as a, <clears throat> the RFSOC 2x2 is a great starter board. Uh, it may be that your lab needs eight channels, but while you're developing uh, stuff, you can develop it on the cheaper board. <clears throat> so rather than having to buy multiple uh, ZCU 111s, which can be challenging, you could perhaps have a couple of ZCU 111s and, and more uh, 2x2 boards. So we see this as a, as a complement rather than a replacement. Or, uh, and, and this means that it's not just uh, what we've shown you is not exclusively for academia. The board is, but the equipment and, and the software is not, or rather the software and the design. Sorry, give me one moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so then uh, I'd like to do some acknowledgments before, before we get to the uh, Q&A. I'd like to say, first of all, we had some great assistance from Analog Devices. You'll notice their logos on the board. They helped us considerably with the uh, power management and, and, and we're grateful for that. Um, and then I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues in the Pink and XUP teams. I think you can appreciate from the um, type of work that's been done here and, and the amount of work that's been done, a lot of effort went into this. And on the one hand, there were the Pink uh, team and, and the research group, and then there was the XUP team. And of course, Bob's team at the University of Strathclyde with Bob and Louise and, and David. So thank you again for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.